Thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, and we go straight to business. Uh, we listened uh, with great interest to what Alex Stupp had to say. And he was depicting a world after 1989 where we all thought everything would be peace and love and friendship. Uh, and that it was the end of history. It was not the end of history, of course, as we now know. And that is why in this panel we unfortunately have to get back to the dark world or the world of hard power. And that's why I have some tough people around me here to do that. And we'll start immediately. What we're trying to do is we, we want to look at, first of all, the state actors, because they're still important. But there are also new actors and new forms of conflict which are going to arise. There are new technologies with huge impact also on the military. And we really have to ask ourselves questions on uh, how the military will cope with all of that. So I'll start with Julien Vaiz, uh, who works for a strong state. Uh, where is he? Oh. Sorry, yeah, uh, Julien. Uh, Justin, Justin. Justin, you, you work for a, for a very strong state uh, uh, and you do policy planning. Uh, the question I wanted to ask to you is, who are, which states are going to be the powerful ones over time? We've heard what Alex had to say about the Anglo-Saxon world and the United States. Um, where will the hard power be and how will it be exercised? How will it be? Will it be unipolar? Will it be multilateral? Will it be some lone wolves out there doing very strange things? So uh, can you please tell us how you see this? Sure, and many thanks for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, uh, so we conducted our own exercise on 2013. Uh, during the first half of 2017, during the electoral campaign, my team thought they could uh, rest for a bit before the elections, but I actually got them to work on 2030. Uh, and uh, perhaps because they were angry at me for uh, giving them more work, uh, they came out with a pretty pessimistic picture of 2030, a world, uh, basically a world of, of carnivorous states, as we, uh, as we called it, in which uh, multipolarity trumps multilateralism and in which uh, the, uh, uh, the rivalry uh, between great power uh, takes the best of the world. Actually, we thought about uh, different possible worlds around two axes. One was uh, whether that world was mostly cooperative or competitive. And the other axis was how power was distributed. And so you can easily see how that uh, describes a number of possible worlds, whether a unipolar one, so if it's cooperative, it would be something like Pax Americana uh, if it's, or Pax Sinica. Uh, if it's non-cooperative, it would be a tyrannical uh, world. Uh, then perhaps it would be bipolarity, so on the cooperative side, it would be a J2 world. On the non-cooperative side, it would be a war in the Pacific. Uh, then, of course, when you go down the distribution of power, multipolarity would give you either that world of carnivorous states on the non-cooperative side, or uh, perhaps uh, a concept of powers that is a world in which that rivalry between great powers is uh, regulated by, uh, if not international law per se, at least rules of the road and uh, commonly admitted uh, uh, norms and, and standards and, and uh, of behavior, uh, etc. Lastly, we considered the possibility of a world where power is even more distributed uh, among many different uh, actors. So either on the cooperative side, a global village uh, that would uh, that would prevail and would lead to uh, uh, perhaps a deconcentration of uh, of power, uh, or uh, perhaps on the more competitive side, a sort of anomic uh, world uh, of uh, a sort of a Mad Max world, uh, if you'd like, where non-state actors would uh, have a say uh, in the world, etc. So how did we come to the conclusion that among these different worlds, one was more likely to prevail, the world of uh, competitive multipolarity? Uh, uh, well, um, <coughs> if we stick to the theme of this uh, 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 panel on the future of war and and, and conflict, I would say three basic reasons. One is that states that are currently the most powerful ones, the US, China, Russia, a couple of other the su super states, uh, if you'd like, tend, tend, to, uh, tend to accrue or to increase their uh, power. Uh, uh, of course, you have non-state actors, you have a diffusion of uh, uh, technology that allow uh, non-state actors to uh, 
to, to play a role. Uh, you have um, uh, situations of uh, gray zones, uh, whether in Africa, in the Middle East, or, or elsewhere. But the basic reality is that these states are reinforcing themselves. Uh, and I'd like to point to the two other uh, uh, reasons uh, for that. Um, one is technology, and the other is nuclear weapons. Uh, technology, uh, because if you look at the ambition we had, or, or the uh, idea, or the ideal we had, was that technology, especially in the beginning of the internet, would um, open an era where uh, that would empower uh, people, uh, non-state actors, etc. And to a large extent, it's true. However, if you look even more closely, what globalization has led to uh, is reinforcing the power of big states uh, over uh, weak states. Uh, if you look at, for example, take the uh, ranking of the most powerful um, uh, cyber states, uh, if you'd like, where they, they're basically the P5 plus a couple of others, like, uh, you know, Iran, um, um, uh, Israel, and a couple of, of others. You have eight or nine real uh, uh, states that are really able in the cyber uh, domain or in cyber war, and that list is pretty similar to the list of uh, uh, of, of hard power. And so uh, technology has actually increased the means of surveillance and coercion, coercion and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and pressure that big states can uh, impose on, on, on small states. The second factor is, I think, nuclear weapons. Since 9-11, we've tended to forget about nuclear weapons. We've not talked about it as much as we used to. Uh, we have uh, uh, tended to focus on other uh, issues uh, in the rivalry of, of great powers. However, I think that's a mistake. I think we will be talking more and more about nuclear weapons. The truth is that arsenals are growing. Some of them are growing fast, like in Pakistan, for example. Uh, we have seen how uh, there was a sort of balance between uh, the ability of the international community to regulate this, the, in the case of Iran, uh, if Donald Trump uh, allows us to keep that, uh, that good deal that we had so much difficulty uh, negotiating. Uh, so, uh, world of regulation, but how long will it last? And then the world of uh, non-regulation, or the world of uh, uh, breaking out uh, nations like, uh, like North Korea, uh, of course. And then, of course, we should add all the uh, threats and the uh, almost loose talk about nuclear weapons that uh, Vladimir Putin has been using and that the Russians have been uh, uh, I've been using. So on the one hand, that puts a damper that, that l uh, limits the uh, uh, re risks of an outbreak of uh, uh, sort of open conflict, open conventional conflict, uh, as it did during the Cold War. On the other hand, uh, it strengthened the hand of, uh, of big states, uh, which can then act under the umbrella of their nuclear weapons. And that's something that we'll have to uh, bear in mind because it will be part of and parcel of that uh, uh, world of uh, carnivorous states. In that world, and the last word on the, uh, 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 on the EU, uh, I think as we are uh, advocating uh, during the, uh, uh, the writing in 2016, uh, the 15 and 16 actually, the writing of the uh, 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 EU global strategy, uh, I think uh, Europe needs to uh, uh, keep its ideals and its ambitions intact for a liberal world, but at the same time that it should seriously strengthen uh, not only uh, its vision and its understanding of the Obsidian world that is uh, already here and that will uh, be more and more of a reality, and also its means to act uh, in that Obsidian world. I'll stop here. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Justin. Uh, I think you quite convincingly explained that there is still a lot of room for states uh, as far as future hard security is concerned. But at the same time, you did allude to uh, possible new actors. And I would like to turn to Florence uh, and ask her whether she can talk a bit about who are those potential new actors? How are they going to act? And how will it change the possibility of conflicts over the coming years? <laughs> Well, you know, in, in foresighting, war is obviously the jackpot in the sense that if, you, if you're good at predicting it, then you apparently have done uh, a really good job. I think the main reason for this impression is that people misunderstand foresighting in the sense that it's not a speculation. Uh, I say that because when I first started doing foresighting work four years ago at the Institute with the Arab Futures Report, I thought this will be fun. I'm just going to imagine what it's going to be like. And it turned out actually that's not how it works. 
Um, so instead of writing my novel, as my colleague said, I had to look at the trends. And so extrapolating from that, um, war, not just in the region that I focus on, but more generally, um, gives us a, there are clear indications for what it will look like. And I have five points, three of which will not be surprising, but two of which will be, will be very different from, from today. So this is what we know. Um, the first thing is um, war will continue to take place in regional clusters. So there is this impression that, oh my god, maybe by 2030 we'll have it all over the globe. No, by 2030 it will still be mainly concentrated in Africa and in the Middle East. That doesn't mean that it won't happen elsewhere at all, but it means that in terms of probability, conflict generates more conflict, so we have unfortunately a clear trajectory from existing conflicts to future conflicts, with which we which will be in this region, or in these two regions. Um, the second point is, you hinted at it, uh, Jim, civil wars. Now, this is also a trend that continues from the 90s onwards. In fact, actually, even before, civil wars will be the majority of conflicts rather than interstate wars. Now, because of uh, the Cold War, there's always been this illusion that interstate wars are more frequent than civil wars, and that civil wars are effectively a phenomenon of the 90s. That's not true. The main difference is that the civil wars aren't ending anymore. So we've always had a significant degree of civil wars, but in the old days, for some reason, they ended, and today, they don't. This is a puzzle for researchers like myself, but we have actually gotten really bad at uh, ending conflicts. So um, they will continue to, to fester over a long period of time. And the problem with civil wars is, number one, all of our regulations, most of our regulations focus on interstate wars, I mean legal provisions, but when it comes to a conflict like in Syria, it's very difficult in legal terms to distinguish between a civilian and a combatant. When does a civilian actually become a combatant in legal terms? Is it the minute he picks up a gun, even if it's in self-defense? So these are, these are difficult uh, issues to tackle. More importantly, civil wars are also more destructive in terms of infrastructure destruction, of course. I mean, Syria is already set back by 30 years. Uh, but also in terms of uh, civilian casualties. The main reason for that is that precisely because there's such a limited um, legal framework and because the actors are blurred, uh, you have non-state actors that don't behave in the same way as state actors. Therefore, the behavior is much, much more, um, let's say, roguish. Um, and the last point is that urbanization leads also to more destruction and more to, to more civilian casualties. The world is becoming more and more urbanized, so wars will take more, place more and more in urban contexts and therefore be more destructive. Um, and the third point is, and it, it echoes a bit with what Justin just said, um, interstate wars are not a thing of the past. I think that's a, that's a very European vision to see conflict mainly at interstate wars and secondly as something that's a thing of the past. Uh, the region that I work on sees an interstate conflict, so that's the Middle East, North Africa, uh, sees an interstate conflict once a decade. So if you're asking me, does that mean that Saudi Arabia and Iran will have some kind of military hang-up at some point? It is likely, yes. I, I can't tell you when, I can tell you to what extent, but we we'll have to, at least in terms of probability, be ready for that. Um, and the same goes for Africa. Africa has, uh, until recently, had this reputation for being mainly a civil war continent. We also see there, in the process of state consolidation, a negative side effect, which is interstate wars. Once states are established enough to conduct war, they actually might do it. Here we have an interesting asymmetry. We have mainly, mainly strong states, what we call vulture states, attacking weak states. So again, there is an asymmetry, not in the sense of new, new uh, or non-state actors versus state actors, but in terms of distribution of power, uh, it will be an interesting scenario. So these are three trends that probably didn't shock you so far, um, but there are two trends that I see that you might have not thought about so far. Um, I'm going to conduct myself for a second, because cyber actually, we've talked about it yesterday at length, so it's not a, a surprising element. Uh, uh, war will expand in the cyber domain. That's not the new bit. I think the new bit, or rather the back to the future bit, is that uh, I predict air force or air wars will become more and more frequent. 
uh, also including non-state actors. We already see that in the region, in the Middle East, North Africa, non-state actors actually not just having surface-to-air missiles, but even flying airplanes, uh, tinkering with drones and so forth. So um, the airspace will we see a sub resurgence in terms of uh, a battlefield. So I call this type of war, it won't be hybrid war, it will be 360 degree war in all places, at all times, using all means. And my last point is, and I think maybe that's a, the, the really surprising thing, and it will probably first rub you the wrong way, is that human rights in this context will continue to expand as the norm. What I mean by that is that human suffering and, and uh, casualties will become less and less acceptable to the global population. And the main reason for that isn't so much necessarily the expansion of democracy, but connectivity. You don't have to, be, to live in a democratic system to uh, disagree or, or strongly, feel strongly about uh, civilian casualties, children, women dying and wanting a reaction. Now this will, as uh, us, as democracies, it will hit us first in the sense that our populations will want us to mediate conflicts fast and when we do go to war, to minimize civilian casualties. If you think of Libya 2011, uh, NATO had to defend the more or less 100 civilians that died uh, as a result of, uh, of its airstrikes. 100, I don't want to, to relativize it, but if you had the same discussion in, I don't know, the 60s, people would say 100, that's nothing. So the, the acceptability of casualties will go even lower. And if your reaction now is, what is she talking about? Nobody cares about human rights. You're proving exactly my point. You're outraged that human rights aren't protected. And I think this will become a force in itself that will force decision makers uh, even further into action. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Florence. That certainly is a provocative thought, and I'm sure it will lead to some, some discussions. I now turn to Thomas Walaszczak. I think uh, what you said about technologies leads over quite naturally to asking him the question, uh, what is it about new technologies? How will it change? How will it have an impact on the actors? Uh, we heard Justin saying that the fact of nuclear power privileges state actors. Is that absolutely true, or will it remain true? And what effect will it have on the way of conducting war, Thomas? Mm. Thank you very much, Jim, for the, for the question, and, and many thanks to all of you um, for taking the time to listen. Um, I, you know, I'll be humble in, in keeping with uh, Florence's um, reminder to us that you know, predictions, particularly about the future, are the most difficult ones to make. So you know, rather than giving you the lay of land of what the future of war will look like, which, by the way, is a body, you know, there's a whole body of literature out there on the subject already, if you're interested. I want to say a few words on what the future of international institutions that manage war, such as NATO, but such as the EU, will look like in the age of technology and the full integration of the new technology um, that's coming our way. So again, it'll be less about the future of war and more about the future of organizations and institutions that manage war. And let me begin very briefly with you know, 10 seconds on, on how the conflicts might be different because there's no escaping a bit of future forecasting if you want to extrapolate from that. You know, at the risk of, again, putting myself out there and being proven wrong in about 20 or 30 years, I find it hard to imagine that the ongoing integration of sensors, data, drones, and machine learning possibly leading to artificial intelligence would in some way or shape or form be arrested. I think that trend line, to use Florence's uh, framework, is here to continue and is here to stay. What that takes you to, the future of war that this likely and plausibly takes you to, is, a, is conflicts that take place literally in, in minutes, if not seconds, that are fought not by dozens of large platforms, but possibly tens of thousands of miniature platforms, and most importantly, platforms, weapon systems, that are largely autonomous, without a human in the loop. And I'm happy to develop this idea more in the Q&A, but I want to pause here and simply say that for the purpose of this conversation, presentation, I think the future is, is, is uh, likely, uh, and therefore what I'll, you know, I'll take it as a granted, and I'll try to tease out some implication therefrom and thereof for the world 
we live in, the world of international institutions, <coughs> diplomacy, and international affairs. And the first thing that jumps out at you when you start thinking about the possible future wars the way I describe them is that the change that's coming our way is not just a revolution in military affairs, but it really is mainly for our purposes a revolution in the role of the humans in military affairs. The role of human beings, you and I, those of you, many of us, many in this room who have been involved or continue to be involved in managing wars on behalf of the institutions or the governments, our role will be reduced dramatically in some places to zero. For you know, millennia it's been the case that humans planned for wars in peacetime, they commanded wars in wartime once they started, and they've executed them. They were, we, were, we were the ones pulling the trigger. With some exceptions, that still largely remains the case. Of course, we get a lot more help and aid from sensors and computers, and there are some micro examples of autonomous systems. You could argue that landmines are an autonomous system. A human does pull the trigger, so to speak, but it's not the human who laid the landmine. Um, but by and large, it still remains the case that humans are in the decision-making loop until the last moment. Even the unfortunately and incorrectly named unmanned aerial vehicles are not really unmanned. They are remotely manned. There is a human being involved. He or she just sits really, really far away. This is about to change. The presence of a human from sort of the early planning to the execution is about to be changed dramatically. If systems become really autonomous, we're being pushed out of the decision-making, certainly out of the execution phase. We're going to see our roles reduced in a command phase, and we're going to see our approach to the planning phase dramatically redefined. This has a few, holds a few uh, uncomfortable conclusions for the inst international institutions that we know and hold dear. Uh, let me tease out two of those implications. And you know, I'm happy to um, go into the more details in the future. First implication is that we will find our opportunity for political control and exercising political control over successive phases of operation once the war starts dramatically reduced. This is bad news. It is bad news because the way we keep our alliances and our unions strong and coherent is by giving all participating country, 28, 27, 29, whatever the number might be, a stake, co-ownership, and not just at the beginning, but also through the successive phases of the, of the operation. That's why we set up this body of institutions, whether it's the PSC in the EU context, whether it's the NAC in the NATO context, the commands, so that the 27, 28, 29 can co-decide. That's important for keeping all of us on board. But that role will be really difficult to execute if most of the decisions are made from a certain fairly high level down by machines. What happens to trust among us, among the 29, 28, 27, whatever the number is, then? What happens if things go wrong and we haven't had a chance to have a say? Second thing, second conclusion or second implication, the way this political control will be exercised will need to change dramatically. At the risk of caricaturing, I can envision a world in which the role of BSC ambassadors, NAC ambassadors could be essentially transformed into understanding the algorithms that are programmed into the autonomous systems before they are programmed and before those autonomous systems are unleashed. To make it worse, it's not just understanding the algorithm as it exists at the beginning of the operation. You need to understand the way the algorithm might develop because it is, a, it is an essential feature of machine learning that the behavior of the machine once it is unleashed, changes. So you need to understand not just whether the commander's intent has been properly interpreted and translated into the algorithm, but you need to understand the options, the possible futures that the algorithm and the machine will then take from the initial intent and, and make sure that you're comfortable with the possible futures. The implication for us is astonishing. I have no clue as a relatively young ambassador, relatively well, recent ambassador, a relatively tech-savvy ambassador, I have no clue how I would exercise that kind of a role. So the demands on us are about to change dramatically. Perhaps the training of the people and the training we put our diplomats, particularly the defense diplomats, through needs to change dramatically. Ten seconds of conclusion. The reason I say so is obvious. 
you know, you, we may disagree, and I hope you disagree with me, and I hope you push back on whether this future is likely or possible. But if you think it's plausible, then the obvious point is that in addition to the conversations we're having on PESCO in the EU context, not just PESCO, EDF, and everything else, in, on EFP, the Enhanced Forward Presence, uh, reinforcing A2AD in the NATO context, in, in addition to all of those debates, we need to start thinking now about the steps we need to take today to retrain our people and perhaps to come up with a slightly different model of exercising political control if we want those institutions to remain relevant and strong. Uh, thanks very much, Thomas, for this fascinating uh, expose, which uh, immediately leads over to uh, the true military sitting here and who will be, of course, directly affected by everything which was said by the three previous speakers, uh, be it about uh, actors, be it about technologies. Uh, and so how is the military nowadays going to cope with, to cope with all of that? How are we going to get soldiers who multipurpose, who understand technology? Uh, does this mean that we can only have professional armies? Uh, how uh, will this impact on uh, the flexibility of the military? So, uh, Wolfgang, if you could enlighten us on the basis of your long experience in the military field. Thank you very much for, for the question. What I would like to try is to set out before you a some trends uh, which impact the military. Um, there are general trends uh, which are not uh, directly linked to what we are discussing here, so the, the changing political environment. Um, the technolog uh, technological trends which were mentioned are part of this. Uh, there, there are several strengths. There is robotics and artificial intelligence. We discussed it. Uh, but there is also the entire realm of, of cyber, uh, which leads us military to prepare ourselves in terms of uh, cyber awareness, in terms of protecting our own systems, but also in, in terms of uh, providing support to other entities uh, for cyber security and cyber defense. It's a small element, but it, it deserves to be mentioned. Um, environmental protection also has an impact, uh, a cost impact and a behavioral uh, impact um, on, on the military. And the, the last general trend I, I would like to mention is the combination of demographics in our countries, uh, social developments. This impacts directly recruitment. Uh, what is the human resource available? And is this, to what extent this human resource um, can be trained uh, in the, for these new situations which were described by previous speakers? We shouldn't forget that in some countries this comes also against the background of a clear overstretch of the human resource for supporting tasks. Uh, we, we see it in France, uh, we see it in other countries. Um, and this is a completely different kind of task. We have to, on the one hand, uh, large numbers of personnel used in very simple guarding tasks. And then we have to train for very sophisticated missions. So there is a dichotomy here. Now, allow me to turn briefly to the trends which are more strongly linked to the geopolitical changes in particular, and the change of nature of our environment. I would mainly describe this as complexities. The military has to deal with. The military individually, as soldiers, the entire chain of command, headquarters, and all those involved in the decision-making processes. I would split it in three layers. There is strategic com complexity. We have, for instance, the fact that Europeans, and I encompass here EU and NATO, um, have to deal simultaneously with aspects of defense, of crisis management, of counterterrorism, of um, migration. We mentioned cyber. And this is extremely difficult 
and probably not possible to establish priorities here. Uh, these things uh, need to be dealt with simultaneously. Um, this puts additional strain on our decision-making processes and on our planning. Uh, then another element is the fact that, particularly for crisis management, and this affects the European Union, and this is also in a way embedded in the global strategy, we have to look simultaneously at a number of potential uh, areas, deployment areas, around Europe also farther away. In, in the crisis belts in uh, Northern Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, here again, um, very difficult to prioritize. Um, the global strategy, by the way, avoided this. And uh, many of these things have to be uh, treated simultaneously. Uh, situations which arise are extremely volatile. Uh, this has also to do uh, with connectivity, and uh, this has to be taken into account by the chains of command. Comprehensiveness. Uh, the chains of command have to deal with a large variety of actors, also in the European Union, and we have to bring this all together. Uh, the military are only part of this uh, mechanism. <coughs> Um, and third layer, the tactical one. The tactical is the battlefield. Uh, the soldier has to deal with all these effects uh, we, we had to, uh, we, we discussed, and uh, they have to, take, have to take this into account. The pr automatization, for instance, robotics, is just arriving, is developing. So we are in a kind of hybrid situation here. We have mainly um, our traditional ways of doing things and growing increasingly, uh, new ways are appearing. So we have to deal with both and we have to combine it. What I would set as a point of conclusion here is uh, this analysis is, and I'm mainly speaking for the European Union, is being conducted at 27 in 27 individual member states, or 28 individual member states. Denmark is uh, to some extent participating, but not in action. At the same time, we are becoming increasingly aware that no, no individual member state will be able to deal with this sustainably, particularly not smaller states, but even the larger states have increasing difficulties to do it entirely alone, without reinforcement, without support, be it political support. So the recent developments in the European Union, and I mentioned PESCO, I mentioned CART, uh, Coordinated Annual Review of Defense, and uh, the EDF are welcome developments. And they should lead, in the end, to common deployable force elements uh, which are available, also politically available, available by political commitment. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Wolfgang. I think that was fascinating oversight of all the challenges uh, the military are facing. Now, we have time for a little debate uh, between, uh, with the panel here, and then we'll open questions. We are slightly behind schedule, so I'll <coughs> uh, I have a question first to Justin. Uh, you mentioned the uh, regional cluster approach for wars and all that. Is it completely excluded that we have a world conflict if, for instance, something happens between China and the United States, or even uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia? Will that be limited uh, regionally, is my first question. And the second very quick question is, how come that NATO seems to have a revival at a time where we have an isolationist president in the White House? Hmm. Um, you know, I think that um, Florence alluded to the uh, uh, widespread phenomenon of civil wars. I, I'm not sure they are really uh, longer than they used to be or that we cannot put an end to them. Uh, it's just a question of time. But where I uh, fully agree with her is that we uh, run the risk of seeing a multiplication of these wars simply because that model of zones of influence, uh, which is the model that we have in, uh, in mind for 2030, uh, will be fully compatible, uh, unfortunately, with that, uh, uh, with that model. I think war against, I mean, war among super states, uh, uh, the US and China, will be limited by uh, the existence of nuclear weapons, might not 
fully be the case for uh, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. What is sure is that it doesn't preclude uh, the uh, multiplication of, uh, of civil wars, and, and uh, I think we have a, a preview of this. Uh, uh, you know, look at what's been happening in the past few uh, months in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, uh, it's not really a civil war because the one side is not really fighting, it's just uh, being the victim of uh, um, ethnic cleansing. Uh, and, uh, and that, I think, unfortunately, is one of the, of the templates or, or the models uh, that, we, uh, that I fear we'll see uh, being replicated uh, in the zones of influence of some of these uh, super states. You'll have uh, civil wars or intrastate wars that will uh, not be limited. So I'm not too worried about major uh, war against, uh, against these super states, but at a lower level, uh, I'm indeed uh, worried that these could uh, multiply and that will be pretty much powerless to act uh, against them. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Florence, you had this uh, interesting theory and very reassuring one about human rights. I, I must confess to being slightly skeptical about it, but can you explain, uh, isn't the fact that we get into really new technologies where you can actually kill without seeing people, you've seen it already in the first Iraq war for instance, uh, 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 and not many, you don't really talk so much about the victims if you don't see them, especially if they're not, they're not Western uh, victims. So don't you think that the dehumanization, the things Thomas was talking about, that this could run directly counter to your very optimistic theory? Well, I think there are two trends in modern technology that, the one trend is that, that you described and that Thomas described about dehumanization. So for the person to pull the trigger, it will be, let's say, emotionally, psychologically easier but that doesn't stop the other dimension of technology is that connectivity increases. So maybe the European public, well, in your theory, doesn't see what's happening on the ground, but that's actually not true. The outrage in 2013 over the Syrians uh, died, dying at the hands of the regime due to chemical weapons uh, was an important one and nearly led to war. Um, I think, therefore, that the two, the two developments in modern technology, on the one hand, make it easier to kill in that sense, but on the other, reinforces the emotional outrage that the public will have towards casualties. That means that, number one, for whoever conducts war, will have to be even more precise. Uh, I think what NATO did in 2011 is a good example of that. Of course, to conduct a war uh, where nobody dies, I think that'll be... The, the ideal that the public would like to have, but I don't think it will happen. Would that would be a video game, but the pressure, the public pressure to achieve that is there due to, as a result of the connectivity. So you have to, these two trends looking like they're going counter to each other, but at the end they come back to the fact that in terms of quantity, I mean the people are simply in the vast majority, and you'll see more and more connectivity, not just within a certain continent or country, it goes all over the borders. So we are, in that sense, connected to an Arab public, an African public, an Asian public. Uh, Justin mentioned Myanmar. Um, I'm not sure if 20 years ago we would have felt the same way about what's going on there as we do today. So I'm not sure if it's pessimistic or optimistic. I just think that human rights, the protection of civilians, of humans writ large, will appear in foreign and defense policy making as an important uh, criteria to take into consideration. How we conduct war, why we conduct war, what efforts do we put it on the table to end war will all play a role, I think, in decision making. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Thomas, you talked about multiple platforms. Uh, uh, can you expand a bit what exactly you mean by platforms here? And uh, will this be total anarchy or can it be mastered? And my other uh, question is, Will technological development make wars easier or more difficult? On the uh, first question, the, the, the possibly biggest difference in, um, in terms of platforms is that you'll see a shift, you may see a shift, I, one needs to be cautious, you may see a shift from a few dozen, again, aircraft carriers, cruisers, uh, to a war that's sort of actually, I think Florence accurately described, as largely conducted by, from the air by thousands of, sort of smaller drones, tens of thousands, acting together, acting as one because they'll be linked in real time. They will be programmed to not only communicate to one another, 
but to learn from one another. So if one detects a vulnerability in the defense system that wasn't assumed at the beginning of the operation and wasn't necessarily planned into the algorithm, the, it will draw the conclusion, inform others, and it will adjust the behavior of the entire swarm, flock, herd, whatever you will, in a, in a heartbeat. That's the main difference I see happening. That's not to say that all of the, the wars will be fought only through application of these swarms uh, of, of drones, if you will. I, I continue to believe that uh, missiles and stand of uh, far distant, distant weaponry will remain important, but it's these, the ability to apply a very intelligent force in in the in a places that are not only vulnerable, but in, in a way that those uh, swarms themselves detect and create vulnerabilities that could make the difference in, um, uh, in, in between sort of winners and losers of the future conflicts. The main distinguishing feature politically for us here is the speed at which all of this happens. Um, Communication between two drones in a swarm is obviously essentially happens in, in, in zero time. Uh, the learning can happen incredibly quickly in the future as well. And the battle, the way the assumption you made about it, literally moment zero, could be completely redefined and could be developed in a completely different way to completely different conclusion within seconds, minutes if not seconds. The speed is the main argument for why I think that the notion that we keep humans in a loop, and this is the way we keep technology under control, we simply will never allow it to go fully autonomous. A human will always be part of a decision making. I, I just don't see that being sustainable. <coughs> because of the speed and because of the advantage that speed confers on the one who has gone autonomous, the insistence on keeping humans in a loop will turn out to be self-defeating. By the time the humans make sense of what's happening and understands the options before him or her, the war will be over, the battle. The battle will be over. But that's a frightening prospect. That is a frightening prospect. I mean, I, I don't say this is the only, fully autonomous warfare is the only possible outcome. I think that a global convention that, that, that in a meaningful way makes the application and the use of autonomous weapons uh, illegal and therefore um, therefore no, no, it, it keeps it from becoming a reality. That's one way of preventing that scenario from materializing. But the idea that we, we will keep the humans in a loop and, the, and will therefore confer an advantage on our adversaries by allowing them to go autonomous, I think that idea is unsustainable because it is self-defeating. We will lose. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Justin, you wanted to... Just a, a two fingers. I'm, I'm a bit skeptical on this, at least that uh, I think that at the very least, uh, um, uh, decision makers and the military in particular will want to remain at least on the loop, that is to say, monitoring what's going on, not, not delegating the opening of fire completely to machines, simply because it can lead, it can backfire. Uh, and also because, uh, you know, we saw that during the Cold War, for example, there was this uh, deterrent system, mm. dead hand, uh, yeah. which was uh, meant uh, by the Soviet Union to trigger uh, a, a, a nuclear strike on the US if uh, the command center of the Politburo had been destroyed. Mm. So that's the ultimate deterrence is to delegate to a machine uh, the opening of, uh, uh, of fire. But I think that was in the context of deterrence for regular uh, quote-unquote uh, warfare, uh, everybody I meet in the military and elsewhere are extraordinarily reluctant to completely delegate that to machines. They want to stay on the loop, not necessarily in the loop, and they want to, uh, to keep that control uh, once again because otherwise it could backfire and lead to unforeseen consequences for their own forces. But, you know, I may be wrong, but that's what I... I Thanks. Just, I had a special question for Wolfgang, but this one is better, so I, I think you should slim it maybe develop on the basis of what you start. Yeah, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. I, I would make two points here. There is an area uh, where a large degree of uh, automatization um, and artificial intelligence in particular uh, can be used without major risk, and this is a situational awareness, um, intelligence, and analysis. So, in, in theory, 
um, one could get the fullest set of information about an area of a potential operation through automatized means. They feed back into artificial intelligence and a big data system, um, which compiles, translates, and informs the chain of command or the decision-making chain. So here, automatization is, is absolutely imaginable. As for, uh, I fully agree with the, the wish of the military to be kept in the loop. And I think uh, this corresponds to the reality. If you imagine uh, a military operation, um, it, it's, there are always several prongs. Uh, one element of it is, for instance, to take out a specific point. So this very specific part of the operation can be automatized, under control. Uh, control means what is, for instance, the likelihood of collateral damage. What is the risk uh, that um, the, the action cannot be stopped uh, for machine failure or, or likely reasons? So the next step could be, theoretically, uh, to, to widen uh, this area, so not one point operation, but to send a swarm, if you wish so, over a territory. So a square, which is exactly defined. Uh, in this square, you drones destroy defined types of objectives. Um, still, this is very much humanly defined and can be stopped. But I have to say, in, in such type, and I conclude on this, in such type of operation, um, a reliable assessment of potential collateral damage is much more difficult already. Thanks very much. I think that was uh, fascinating for all non-experts here. Uh, we now have about a quarter of an hour for uh, questions and answers. So I will start with the gentleman over there. We have quite a few questions. Please, questions. Uh, no long statements, because we want the... Go ahead, Tim. non-state uh, actors uh, in garage, in do-it-yourself settings, is this, uh, does this enter uh, the scenarios as an additional dimension of uh, serious threat, or is this just a sideline? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to answer that question? I can answer it. Um, yes, we are already there, in fact. The future has already arrived in that negative sense. We know from uh, the territories liberated uh, by the Islamic State, for instance, that they were extensively involved in uh, research and development on uh, chemical weapons, uh, drones, uh, all kinds of uh, aspects that we didn't think they would be capable of. So uh, where one non-state actor has done it, others will try to do the same. Hence what I said earlier, um, this the increasing lethality, especially of internal conflicts, because that doesn't mean that a state actor will refrain from using these elements. We've seen it in Syria. Uh, but in this case, there is no control whatsoever over uh, what these non-state actors are doing. So um, it's already a part of the discussion. And um, I said non-state actors learn from each other. Uh, so they, even those that are opposed to IS will copy of in, 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 in on its uh, tactics in that regard. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe next question. I had a gentleman here. One gentleman there, and then a lady over there. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Hans Christian Hagman from the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, excellent panel. Um, the one conclusion which one can draw from this is that democracies will lose. Um, if democracies are emotional, think of collateral damage and the civilians, we follow rules, we like conventions. Um, how do we manage automatic warfare? environmental considerations, uh, we have old institutions who like to be in control, we have old naval war colleges who do things as we do, uh, trade unions, we're pro-humans, anti-robots, nostalgia, um, and then you add who invests most in AI, uh, and it's probably not us. So my question is, those countries who start from scratch, 
seem to be having an advantage and do not have these say, shackles of, of morality and ethics, if you would start from scratch, what should we be doing to have alternative structures to leap forward? Thank you. Hmm. That's a weighty question. Uh, who wants to volunteer? Wolfgang? <laughs> <laughs> Against the backdrop of the fact how low the, the, the average level of uh, research expenses in, in uh, European member states on defense is, I am not very hopeful that uh, we can sustain a leap very, in, in, in an immediate uh, future. I think the proposals made by uh, the commission, commission and the Council combined uh, can sustain and, and support uh, such, such a leap. Currently, from, from my military observation, uh, we, we do not have the structures to do this, not collectively. Um, this is something which needs to be thought about. I, I would combine it with the observation, and I could do it on this, on my side, the European Union um, for security questions is not very well equipped uh, with situational awareness, uh, combined situational awareness. So this could fit into this. Yeah. Thanks. This is such an important question. Uh, two fingers. Um, quickly. If the others I, I, one I word hear, they can, because it's very important. Yeah. I hear the concern, and I, I know I know what you mean by that. I don't. I. I I've struggled, those who know me know that I struggle with the notion that uh, we have a very fractured relationship with conflict in Europe. We essentially see war as never the right answer. Um, and, and because I work on the Middle East, I suppose, I think that's, um, that's misguided. What we need in order to not lose out, as you described it, is to have an open discussion. Um, I'm half German. In Germany in particular, the the the, the the, the fracture is particularly strong, but we need to reevaluate when is military force actually useful to solve certain problems. Because at the moment, you can't even, it's a complete taboo, you can't even say it might actually solve certain things. However, and that's actually the good note I'd like to end on, you said democracy is going to lose. Ultimately, all of the states, regardless of democratic or not, the more connected they are, the less acceptable, come back to what I said earlier, casualties, conflict, and war are to the general public. Now, that doesn't mean that everything will be rosy, but I think whereas on the one hand, we have to do the homework to think more about conflict, the others inevitably have to do the homework work to redefine when they use military force. Thanks, very quickly, Thomas. A quick point on time. Um, the world I talked about is still decades away. There are some limited autonomous systems today, arguably some sort of complex layered ballistic missile defense systems today, are close to autonomy in a sense that the space for human intervention is measured in minutes and it's kind of limited, yes or no. Um, but the sort of thing that I talk about applied on a meaningful scale decades away. Time is important because I caution against the assumption that the other actors whether it's China, Russia, and others who will be applying the technology, I caution against the assumption they will look the same in 30 years that they look today. Perhaps they will have changed by then to the extent that there is genuine domestic reasons, demand, appetite for curbing the power and the control of the technologies. Who knows? Okay. Uh, it's more a footnote than a two-finger. Uh, 15 years ago or so, Robert Cooper had this brilliant uh, yeah. small uh, uh, booklet on the postmodern state uh, where he yeah. explained that in the world, in the world order of the 2000s, you had pre-modern states, modern states, and modern states, and the EU being uh, the only example of the third one. But what he said, the prescription that went along with this uh, description was uh, the idea that uh, in the beyond uh, the realm of the postmodern uh, state, that is where states are modern, and the evolution of the world since then has reinforced these modern states, uh, the EU should yes. act uh, uh, and should behave as a modern state, that is, sometimes use force. And I'm not so, let's say, yeah. not so sure that European uh, publics will uh, always uh, prefer, let's say, non-intervention than, than intervention. Uh, if only because sometimes they will ask for action, as you mentioned, uh, 
uh, Florence. The question, of course, is whether there will be any ability, any agency by the EU to act in this realm and to uh, model the world more according to its ideals and ideas. Thanks, Justin. Now, very quickly, the two last questions, uh, very quickly. Short questions, please, because we have exactly six minutes. Uh, from the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Um, we heard about civil wars, uh, regional wars, or, or nuclear weapons and so forth. My question is, what about our war with non-state or new state actors? I mean, in Africa we see still Boko Haram, we see still ISIS, Al-Qaeda and so forth. I think they're still on the agenda. The question is, how do you see this evolving to 2030? Yeah, thanks. I'll take the last question immediately. Please, the next. And then the panel can Thank include you. each one one minute. Thank you. It's more like two fingers question. Uh, my name is Alessit Kachava. I'm a professor at Vissalos College. And the question that I have is about the future of hybrid warfare. We're assuming that we're either at war or at peace, but there are cases when we don't know what's going. Do you see this trend becoming more prevalent and what we're doing to address that? Thank you. Yes, hybrid. 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 Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I suggest that one minute each, you take one or two, one or the other of the questions. So, uh, you start, you start. Uh, yeah, obviously the question, I'll address the question of, uh, of, of the war against uh, military groups and, and non-state actors. Uh, how will it evolve? I'm uh, really worried that we'll be in for the long haul. That is to say, uh, especially in the Sahel and uh, most probably uh, in other places in the, in the Middle East uh, as well. And the reason is uh, there is no uh, asymmetric warfare uh, works. Uh, in the sense that uh, big states, uh, when they act in these gray zones, not in the, on their home uh, turf, uh, and in the zones that are uh, less di disputed and less uh, included in the zones of influence of uh, one, one big uh, power, are at a disadvantage uh, since the uh, cost of creating uh, trouble for a, either a, a just a, a uh, a, a jihadi group or a non-jihadi group, just an armed uh, rebellion, etc., uh, is still very uh, strong. And so, unfortunately, I see these uh, sort of uh, 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 police duties uh, as uh, being imposed uh, on us, us meaning uh, collectively, and, and even though we are making uh, the best, uh, we're making the most to uh, ensure that this police work will be done by uh, locals by, um, for example, by Africans themselves, and that's very often the case. Uh, very often we will need to reinforce uh, their efforts and to serve as a backup uh, for their uh, policing uh, these uh, large zones. Many thanks, uh, Florence, on the same question, and then I'll ask the other question to the two gentlemen. Um, I think there are two things about the non-state actors. The first is that obviously non-state actors today and in the future will act more like state actors in the sense that if you look at Hezbollah or the Houthis, or of course Islamic State, um, they uh, use air force, they use uh, uh, cyber, they um, actually conquer and hold territory like a regular army. So uh, for, for, for the military, that means that in tactical terms, it will be a different, different uh, beast. Uh, there is no longer this guerrilla, well, it will, might, will continue to exist where it's technically necessary, but it's not just guerrilla warfare. So hence, I would actually go away from hybrid warfare. I'll just say it's just warfare everywhere, whenever you can, whenever it's necessary. But linked to that is the, uh, in the Middle East, most non-state actors, and I think it's probably the true everywhere, are an expression of a political discontent. So the solution, Europeans always think that all the solutions to political problems are political. Well, in the Middle East, but it's usually seen the other way around. Uh, they're seen as a military problem, and therefore have to be dealt with militarily. The answer is, as always, somewhere in between. So we have to be able to use military force, but flank it with political efforts. Thanks very much. Uh, Tomasz, on the question on the trends. The question more narrowly was whether we'll see more hybrids in the future, and the obvious answer is, uh, you know, the way the, the two simple guidelines they guide whether tactics and technologies are adopted are does it work and do the negative consequences of using it outweigh the benefits. And when you look at the, what happened with hybrid in Crimea, uh, clearly it has worked in a sense of softening up the uh, the arrival of, of Russian troops and so forth. And it you know it was met it was done with impunity. So um, so in that particular moment, clearly 
uh, the conditions were met. That's not to say the conditions will remain the same in the future. Uh, you have already seen that it's becoming less and less effective. Uh, we just had on a panel, you looked at the attempted hybrid intervention in the French elections. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it kind of fizzled uh, because there was deliberate decisions not to give the, uh, the leaks the added weight of publishing them on the front pages of a newspaper. So resilience is changing the effectiveness. And there, the other side of the equation, the negative consequences, that we can also dial that up, dial that down. We can dial it up by demonstrating that we have the capacity to hit our adversaries uh, or whoever will try it against us with something equal or possibly more devastating. We can ratchet up the, the consequences as well. So whether it's adopted or not is entirely up to us. If, if we do nothing, it will continue to be adopted. Many thanks. And maybe Wolfgang, the last word. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, so also reverting to hybrid, I very much agree on, on that. The the term hybrid warfare was coined in the context of the uh, Crimea events. But what is it uh, on, on a more abstract level? It's the combined use of military and non-military instruments in order to minimize the aggressor's uh, human, uh, physical, financial, and political cost. And this will remain an objective of whatever aggressor in the future. So these combinations uh, will stay. And uh, to conclude on my side, uh, the EU has started uh, to create instruments uh, able to deal with that. This is embryonic. Uh, this should be broadened. Uh, and uh, as a, speaking as a military, um, performance C2 structure is also an essential element to it. Many thanks. It is exactly 11.25, so... So I will not conclude. I will simply uh, want to thank the panel because I thought it was a very rich discussion. I would have loved to continue, but there we are. Thank you.